This week, the media headlines were going full blast. Apparently, you can get heart disease by eating too much protein. And of course, this blew up on social media. So what's this all about? They're talking about a new study that just came out in the journal Nature Metabolism. And I went over the study. It has a lot of experiments. It's a large study. It mainly has three parts. Part one is in humans, they took 14 volunteers and they fed them two liquid meals, one with 10% of calories coming from protein and the other with 50% of calories from protein. Fat was held constant at 17% of calories. And so obviously the rest was carbohydrate, 73% of calories from carb in the lower protein drink and 33% in the higher protein drink. After they consumed these liquid meals, these drinks essentially, they drew their blood and they looked at their monocytes. So monocytes are a type of white blood cell that can transform into a macrophage and play a role in atherosclerosis and plaque buildup inside the artery walls. And on the higher protein diet, on that 50% of calories from protein, the monocytes in the participants' blood had an activation in what's called the TOR pathway. So TOR stands for target of rapamycin. And so this is a biochemical pathway that plays a role in growth, in metabolism, in nutrient sensing. So basically this pathway detects concentration of nutrients that's available, that's present, and in response, it regulates metabolism. So it makes sense that it's activated by higher protein intake and higher protein availability. And then they also showed some downstream effects, things that are regulated by the TOR pathway, like autophagy, for example, in these same cells, autophagy was downregulated, which makes sense. That usually happens downstream of an activation of TOR. And these are all acute changes. So the participants had one meal, and in the hours that followed, they saw these biochemical changes. Now, in this experiment, they didn't use pure protein. They used a commercial supplement that contains a fair amount of protein, but it also contains some other ingredients. So they ran a second experiment. Uh, that they say might be a more real world setting. They took nine volunteers this time and they fed them two different diets, both made of mixed foods and actual foods, so not a commercial mix, both 450 calories, but one was 15% of calories from protein and the other was 22% of calories from protein. And fat was 30 to 35% of calories in both diets and carbs were 48 to 50% ballpark. And they basically saw similar results to the previous experiment. The TOR pathway was again activated in the monocytes of the participants on the higher protein diet. So the 22% of calories from protein in this experiment. So this was part one of the study, these experiments in human beings eating higher protein diets and seeing this activation of the TOR pathway in their monocytes. Part two was in cell culture. So cells in a Petri dish they looked at some human macrophages and some mouse cells. So cells sitting in a lab dish and then throwing protein on those cells. And in that setting, they also saw an activation of the TOR pathway. And then they dissected this some more and they figured out that this effect was mainly being mediated, if not exclusively, by leucine. So leucine is the one amino acid that seemed to uh, dictate this uh, activation of the TOR pathway. And then the third and last part of the paper looked at mice fed a number of different diets of increasing protein content. So four diets, 7%, 15%, 21%, and 46% of calories from protein respectively. And on the higher protein diet, so the 46%, they saw an increase in plaque size in the arteries of the mice fed that diet. So overall, I think it's an interesting study. The experiments are pretty well carried out. I think it leaves a lot of questions open. In the experiment with mice, the only diet where they saw that increase in plaque size was the highest protein diet. So 46% of calories coming from protein. For reference, people in the US get an average of 16% of their calories from protein. And that's in the US where people eat a fair amount of protein. Other countries, it might be even less. So it seems like a big difference. In absolute terms, these mice on this 46% of, pro of calories from protein diet got around one and a half grams of protein per day, per animal, per mouse. That might not sound like a lot, but mice are tiny. Mice weigh around 20 or 30 grams. So I did the math that amounts to roughly 50 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. And for reference, we humans eat around 
one gram of protein per kilo of body weight. The RDA is 0.8, but most people in the West eat more than that, around 1, 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, this general range. So this seems like a huge difference in protein intake. Now, this might not be a fair comparison. It might be a little naive to look at the numbers like this. There are metabolic differences. Mice eat a lot of calories and a lot of mass of food in proportion to their body weight. Their metabolism is faster. There are all these differences, right? It's not apples to apples. And that's kind of my problem. It's hard to know what exactly this was, would correspond to, this higher protein diet that they fed the mice. What exactly this would correspond to for humans? The authors did try to establish a parallel there. They argue that the mice on this diet are getting essentially twice as much diet as they get on their standard laboratory chow. And so they say this might be similar to human beings eating twice the RDA. To me, that argument sounded like a bit of a stretch. I went over the paper in its entirety twice carefully. I didn't want to just be glib and dismiss things. Now, I'm not a specialist in mouse physiology or mouse nutrition. So I talked to a couple of colleagues who do have a lot of experience in this area. And they also seem to think that this was a very large amount of protein, even for a mouse. But I'm happy to be proven wrong. If there is a contrary argument, I'm happy to hear it. Bottom line for me, this is a textbook, what we call a mechanistic study, looking at changes in biochemical pathways, experiments in cell culture, experiments with lab animals. It raises really interesting questions, but it's hard to extrapolate directly to humans. And that's not really what it's designed for. They show, I think pretty convincingly, that you give a mouse enough protein and you see an increase in plaque size in their artery walls. Does the same thing happen in humans? Unclear. This paper doesn't, doesn't really address that. And if so, in what range of protein intake? Also unclear. So how do these findings, how does this study relate to the data in human beings looking at actual risk of heart disease, what we call outcome data? The authors write that their results help explain the increased cardiovascular disease mortality associated with high total protein intake and animal protein intake, but not plant protein intake. What they're referring to is that we see in a number of studies that plant protein intake is linked to lower cardiovascular risk than animal protein intake. That is true and that is reproducible. I've seen at least a half a dozen studies showing that finding. So they're saying, well, animal protein tends to have more leucine. So what they figured out might be the explanation for this risk differential that we see in these human studies. Now, personally, I've always been skeptical that these results that are out there with human risk of heart disease are actually due to animal protein itself, that animal protein is the problem here at stake. For example, we consistently see lower cardiovascular risk with fish. If animal protein was the problem, we'd expect fish to raise cardiovascular risk, right? We'd expect fish to look more like red meat than beans and nuts in terms of cardiovascular risk. But we see the opposite. So I think it's much more likely that animal protein and plant protein are just markers of the other nutrients that come with it. For example, fat quality, this balance between saturated and unsaturated fats. There's a lot of evidence that this balance, this ratio, this proportion is a key determinant of cardiovascular risk. And of course, fish, especially fatty fish, has a lot of unsaturated fats, and so it's linked to lower risk. So it seems to me the fat balance, this fat quality, is a much better explainer of this risk relationship that we see in the human data than the animal protein versus plant protein. We can't formally rule out that there is a protein or a leucine threshold that raises cardiovascular risk in humans. We can't say that that's been completely ruled out. But if that exists, it seems like it would be a minor factor that would be overshadowed by these other factors that are more well-established. So bottom line, I think the study is interesting. The experiments are well carried out. I think it was a bit overblown by the media. I think we should continue to investigate in human beings if there is a threshold for leucine or a protein that raises cardiovascular risk. I'm open to it if the evidence shows it. Right now, I don't think we have any compelling evidence that that's the case. Here's a lot more on protein. How much do you really need? RDA or more? And here's a video on animal versus plant protein for muscle building.
Check those out. I'll see you over there.